Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, I'm Martin Tyson. I'm Oscar's Head of uh, Regulation Improvement, and I'm really happy to see you all here for uh, this seminar on, uh, on fishing. Um, what uh, we're uh, looking at today is that uh, specific issue of, of fishing, uh, but the general issue of cybersecurity and the vulnerability of, of charities along with other organizations is a major concern at the moment with uh, so many of us working online and uh, so much of our work being done online and, and, and through online uh, portals, through emails and uh, through other uh, electronic means. Uh, at OSCA, uh, as part of our uh, notifiable events process, we do see uh, a, a number of uh, charities registering uh, concerns with us uh, that they've been victims of uh, phishing along with other types of, you know, the, the more generic types of scam. Uh, so we know this is a, a, an issue. So uh, we're really glad to be uh, having uh, some real uh, expert people along this event this afternoon. Uh, we've got uh, Alison Stone, who is the Cyber Resilience Coordinator from SCBO. We've got Kirsty Steele, uh, who is the uh, Cyber Resilience Community Lead at the Scottish Business Resilience Centre. And uh, her, part of her role is to raise awareness of uh, cyber resilience practices uh, and you know, to, to you know, raise awareness of, of guidance and, and toolkits in that area. And we've also got Mark Cunningham-Dickey, who is the Cyber Incident Response Manager from the uh, Scottish Business, Resil uh, Business Resilience Centre. And uh, Mark, before he came to the SBRC, was uh, working with Police Scotland and looking after uh, their vulnerabilities and, and their resilience. So obviously a, a great deal of expertise there. Um, I was just checking out uh, Alison's uh, activities for SCBO and I was looking at her latest blog. Uh, the uh, title of which is, uh, Oh, the scams online are frightful. Uh, so, uh, but you know, the, 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 the content is better than the pun. Um, and what that the content does tell us is that there is uh, a lot going on out there. There's a lot, uh, a frightening variety of uh, means to, to get our money, but particularly to get our data uh, that, that people are, are, are trying to use out there. And you know, we need to be aware and we need to have the, 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 the means of combating those. So, uh, without detaining you further, I'll uh, I'll pass on to Kirsty and, and Alison and Mark. I should say uh, we have uh, some of my colleagues as well from uh, from Oski here. We have uh, Paula who is uh, is running the, the, the meeting, and we have my colleagues uh, Judith and Ian here as well. Uh, and uh, you know, I think we'll all be uh, around later on in the, the proceedings uh, and hopefully there'll be a, a really good discussion uh, of the, the, the topics that we've been talking about. Okay, so Kirsty, Alice and Mark, I'll, I'll let you move on. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Can everybody see the presentation okay? That's good, yeah, all good. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Martin, for introducing us. Um, we're here today to, to, to talk to you about um, cyber resilience, cyber security, um, and particularly around the subject of phishing. Um, I was just telling everybody who I, we were chatting amongst ourselves before you guys joined us on the call that I was asked by my father-in-law, when did I learn all about phishing? Um, he was under the impression that I was sitting by a riverbank and, and casting a net, but that is absolutely not the case. This is more cyber related. Um, so we're, we're going to run through some of the specifics uh, around that subject. Um, we're going to, to, to touch on initially about why cyber securities and cyber resilience is so important for organisations in the third sector. Um, you might think, well, why, why should a cyber criminal target us? We're doing some really good stuff. Um, and we're going to just have a little bit of a, a recap as to why the, the third sector organisations, voluntary sector organisations need to be aware and need to be concerned. Um, then we're going to have a bit of a deep dive into phishing. Um, Mark is going to use his um, his insight into all things criminality to talk a little bit about motivations um, and some element of social engineering. 
um, and then we're going to do some signposting on on how you guys can get help and, and access further resources to make sure that you can protect yourself that little bit better but that's going to take us the next 45 50 minutes um, we'd love questions and answers and a good chat at the end um, do you chat functionality um, and you know let's try and get something out of this session for you uh, the session is being recorded so um, please be aware of that Perfect. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. It's great to see so many of you on the call uh, today. So as um, Martin and Alison have said, I'm Kirsty. I am the Cyber Resilience Community Lead at the Scottish Business Resilience Centre. And we help organisations, uh, charities, businesses with improving their cyber resilience. And uh, before my role with, within SBRC, I was part of the Scottish Government Cyber Resilience Unit. So that's part of the policy team. We have a strategy for making Scotland a cyber resilient nation. Uh, so Safe, Secure and Prosperous was launched in 2015. And uh, there's five action plans that are trying to implement and improve Scotland's cyber security. And obviously the work here within the third sector action plan is all about raising awareness and making sure that organisations are prepared for the, as much as they can be for any potential attacks. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll dive straight into it, I think, here. So we are going to go straight to Alison. Somebody was going to have to say you're on mute just then. Can you get through a call these days without somebody saying you're on mute? <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm no longer on mute. Um, so yes, cyber attacks and why are charities so at risk? Um, it, it's really helpful to have a, a, a sort of definition at this stage about what a cyber attack is, um, just so you understand the, the parameters of, of what we're talking about. Cyber attacks are, um, are, are, are malicious, and that's a really, really key word here. It's a malicious attempts to either damage, disrupt, or gain unauthorized access to computer systems, IT networks, mobile devices that we live our lives on these days. We absolutely do live so much more electronically than ever before, particularly since the start of remote working and, and the COVID pandemic. Uh, when we're talking about damaging, um, that could be something like somebody, um, a, a, a cyber attacker, um, deletes a database that, that, that they may have been able to acquire that belongs to you. Um, it could be in an attempt to disrupt your, your working. Um, there's, there's a thing called a denial of service attack, which is an example of disruption. Um, that's where uh, computer bots bombard a website um, with a lot of traffic. And the aim of that is, is to try and, and, and take that website down um, to stop people actually working and being productive. Um, and the other one about gaining unauthorized access, that could be by either getting into the back end of your systems via malware um, or just trying to guess uh, the combination of username and password that we use so commonly um, that will give people so much more access to so many different websites if you use them multiple times, multiple different things. So why are charities at risk? I mean, we, we, we talked about we do good stuff. Why would anybody want to attack the third sector? Um, and there's a couple of reasons why why criminals or, or, or why our sector is, is appealing as everybody else's. Your cyber criminal doesn't differentiate between the work that you're doing and the work that an SME or a public sector body does. You are basically just a cash cow to them. Um, so they're, they're really very, very keen just to and, and view you as another way of, of getting data or information or potential money from them. As a sector, we hold quite a lot of funds, we hold quite a lot of personal data, we hold quite a lot of commercial data, and that has a monetary value to your cyber criminal. Um, so they may want to, to access that and, and use that to manipulate you um, into paying ransoms, for example. Um, the other thing that we have as a sector is when we have data sharing agreements, for example, um, when we're working with a local authority, your organization may be the entry point to a larger organization. If your cybersecurity um, protocols are not that strong, um, cyber criminals can rattle at your door, so to speak, get into the back of your systems and use that to access other systems, maybe for bigger organizations with more valuable data. The third point is there's a low level of awareness, um, particularly among smaller charities. That That is a, a, a sad fact. Um, there is not, not quite ambivalence within the sector, but there there is, everybody is always so busy doing what they, they need to do in their day job. Um, and the awareness of cybersecurity has, has not been there in the past. 
um, that's something that I look to address as, as part of my role. Um, so we're, we're going out there and spreading the word. I think hopefully since we have moved to the more of the working from home environment, people are and have seen so many more scams that have, have come to light since COVID started. Um, people are more aware of the need to be so much more secure. Um, but we can touch on some, some helpful advice about that later. Finally, um, we've got a huge culture of trust within the third sector. And it's actually one of the things that I like the best about it, um, but it can go against us. Uh, we're the only sector that I know if somebody phones you up and said, look, you do some really great work, I want to give you a hundred grand. We quite happily hand over our bank account details and expect them to pay a hundred grand into it. Um, equally, we trust everybody in our organization to, to use the, the systems um, and networks that we provide for them in, in the best possible way. Um, so we, we have this culture of trust, which has in the past been used against us. So why or how are charities being attacked? There's a number of sort of attack vectors, methodologies that we see being used by cyber criminals and people wanting to do you damage. You may have heard of ransomware. That's when some files within your network are are, 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 are grabbed in inverted commas um, and ring fence so you can't get access to them. Um, you might, if you have an attack of ransomware, you might log onto your systems first thing in the morning and get this horrible notice that does make you feel a little bit sick um, saying your, your, your access to your data is, is now locked. You need to pay us quite a lot in a huge amount of bitcoins for you to be able to get this back. Um, and that, that, that's a type of ransomware. Um, and it's, it's, as I say, it's, it's ne never a good thing to see. Um, the other thing that we talk about is malware and spyware. Malware is basically malicious software. Um, and that is introduced into, into networks, onto your phones, into your tablets, um, to either do a particular act to, for example, get that data in the ransomware, um, or to just sit there and, and look through the back of these systems, looking out for these credentials, those usernames and passwords um, that could be used elsewhere to get more access to more information about you and your organization. Another thing that we see in the sector, um, or in, in cyber generally, um, is quite a lot of fake organizations and fake websites. One of the things that we see, or we, we, we see quite quickly when there is, for example, a natural disaster somewhere in the world, um, you see very quickly these fake fundraising websites that will pop up really just to take advantage of, of people's good hearts who are wanting to go and donate money to that. Um, you suddenly you see things that will, will arrive that are, are, are not the legitimate source to whom you should be do donating. Um, so it's always something to be mindful of um, when you're, you're looking at a website. Um, they, they, yeah, they, they, there's a fair amount of this that has, has gone on and, and we've seen increasing amounts of that during the COVID period as well. Um, the final one is business email attacks or phishing. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Kirsty, who's going to, to give us the, the deep dive into what that's all about. Kirsty. Thanks, Alison. Uh, before I jump into to phishing there, um, Alison showed a, a, a great overview of the most common sort of cyber attack methods that we've seen. Um, and obviously the extent of cyber threats has not diminished. Uh, the latest reports from the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, the DCMS Cyber Security Survey, um, shows that, that there's almost half of businesses in the UK and about a quarter of charities are reporting to have cyber security breaches in the last 12 months. And like the previous years, this is higher, you know, among, you know, larger income charities, for example, as well. So since we've all been working from home, the attacks have all increased and criminals have basically taken advantage of us, uh, you know, our different work practices that we're doing and um, organisations and uh, businesses and charities have had to rapidly deploy a lot of remote systems in order so that we can kind of continue to work from home. But the criminals have also taken advantage of this as well and increased their security vulnerabilities to try and steal data, generate profits or generally cause disruption. And phishing is the topic that we're going to talk about today because it remains the most common attack method that the cyber criminals will use. One in every 3,000 odd emails is a UK phishing attempt. Um, so, you know, there, there's a huge amount of uh, cyber attacks coming from this, this main method. And as Alison has been pointing out, COVID has been an absolute godsend for cyber criminals where 
the threat actors have revised their usual sort of phishing methods and just put a nice COVID twist to it to try and get you to give hand over your information or, or steal your details about it. And um, we've got some stats from the start of the year until August. There's been a 350% increase in the amount of phishing attempts. So you can see here that the, the state of play is, is a huge one to be uh, aware of and, and try and help best protect yourself for it. But what is phishing? Um, well, this is where you get sent an email that appears to be genuine, but it's actually fake. So it might try to trick you into revealing sensitive information, or it might contain a link to a malicious website or an attachment that's infected with a virus. And some phishing attempts are scattergun and others are more targeted at you or your organization. And phishing attempts typically arrive via email, but it also can be via social media, text message, or phone calls. And your organization should be doing lots of things behind the scenes technically to protect from phishing, but you can actually play a massive role in taking some simple steps. So attackers will use publicly available information about you and your organization to make their phishing attempts seem more convincing. You know, they've often um, having a look at your website, your social media, your professional networking sites to try and gather this information. And this is not expecting you to kind of remove all traces of yourself from the internet, but uh, rather just review your privacy settings for your accounts and think about what you post. For example, you know, avoiding specific details about your organization or your role, especially if it involves handling sensitive information or money or anything that sort of requires a, a higher privilege IT access. Now you're less likely to fall for a social engineering attack if you know what to look out for. And there's indicators of a phishing attempt that you could do um, that are quite common. There's usually a sense of urgency or authority that cues you to do some, to do an act, to click on a link to review your settings. And there's always sort of some pressure behind that to do it within a certain time frame, for example. And then the advice is given on many training packages is based on spotting some of these standard signs. Um, and some of these will have been aware of, you know, check for poor spelling and grammar. And these can be a really good place to start, but they cannot be used to spot all types of phishing emails. Um, and what they normally do is fishers will try and um, exploit the sort of normal business communication processes. So if someone in your uh, workplace uh, is after money, they might target your finance team by mimicking them or by bypassing some of the normal invoice processes. So just make sure you know in your organization's policies what those are and the processes to, to make to, to, um, to it'll make it easier for you to spot any unusual activity. I'm going to show you a, a short video here that will explain some of the, the key steps on how to spot some fake um, emails and not take the bait.
has to be one of the best videos ever, Kirsty. <laughs> it's a it's a really good one of summing up some of the the key things to be looking out for. And I hope you were playing close attention there because we are going to play a game of catch the fish. Let's see if you can spot if the emails here that I'm going to show you are indeed real or if they're fish. So uh, let's let's have a go. Let's play it together. I'm going to show you an example here on the screen. So we have uh, an example email here. It says, dear customer, we're writing to you because we need to speak to you regarding your uh, security concern on your account. And our records indicate that you've recently used Alpha Express card. And for your security, new changes to the account listed um, have been declined. And what you need to do is secure your account by logging in. And your prompt response regarding this matter is appreciated sincerely, Alpha Express Identity Protection Team. Now, taking a look at this um, email here, uh, I want you to have a look at it. And maybe if you could shout out if you think it is a real or a fish one, or it, indeed maybe spot some of the concerns that you have. Why do you think it's that? So you can unmute yourselves here for this one. It's a fish. Yeah, it's, it's a, a fish. 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 Yeah. Yeah. What, what's your, fish. What's your feelings? A big fat fried fish. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. What was your reasons there behind it? First two lines. First two lines. What about them? Uh, the security concern. The concern spelt wrong. Also, the website address. The last bit is not there it's basically up here you get that i don't have your actual name on as well yeah. and a card a card issue like that would have your actual name yeah. at the top of the email yeah yeah, yeah you, you've spotted there that it says dear customer instead mm -hmm. of indicating who it was and i think you were all right and exactly that it is indeed a, a fish um, there is those sort of tips there. There was that sense of urgency. You had to do it quite quickly. They were causing you some panic within your um, team. You know, your, your, it was going to be declined if you, you didn't do it within a matter of the suggested feelings there. So they might put that pressure on you to respond quickly to an email to reduce the sort of negative implications. Um, and they're wanting you to secure your account or uh, by you know, clicking on that link. And they're trying to show you that sort of authority by expressing who, who they've been uh, pretending to be at the bottom, so that Alpha Express. And people who are you know, distracted in their workplace or they catch you at four o'clock on the Friday afternoon, those can be kind of, um, you might not be able to spot some of those things there that you, that you managed to see on the screen. Right, you were great at that one. Let's try this one. Here's your next one. So you've got another email here from Justin Williams. And it says, the message has been held to a queue, unique file type. Reasons for this are indicated below. Attachment, and it's a booklet file, and contact IT desk service for further assistance. I can see Gail with her, with her finger up here. Um, one of my first thinkings is that if um, you've got, I mean, if it's a message that you've sent, you can go and check your own sent messages. I've done this sometimes. I've gone and checked and thought, no, that went, that's fine. They're just a scammer. I think this is one that's coming in to you. Right, okay. In which case you could contact your own IT, IT department by phoning them and saying, is there anything held up? Yeah, yeah, that, like that's some excellent there. steps there. Yeah, so do you think this one is a real, real uh, or do you think it's a fish? It's a fish, I think. Looks dodgy, Kirsty. Is everybody saying it's a fish? I, think I, I can only see like four people on my screen, so like, Give me a show. Yes. Fish. Fish. Baz is saying something. Baz, what are you going to say? I'm saying it's legit because there is no course suggested in this email beyond contacting the people you know. It doesn't tell you to click a link. It doesn't tell you to call a number. It doesn't tell you to email back. So the next action would be for you, according to this email, for you to contact your IT service desk. Interesting. And that's similar to what Gail was saying, but she thought it was the fish example. So I mean, it I might be nonsense, right, <laughs> the message. I'm not saying it's not a valid email, but, you yeah. know, it's yeah. a, one of the less dangerous ones. Let's find out. The answer mm. is, this is real. This is an automated notification 
that an attachment meant for the user hasn't passed the technical controls of the email system. So it was a banned file that they were trying to send in to you. Um, and the, like, you, like you were just saying there, you know, you're not being encouraged to respond to the message directly. You're being indicated to, to phone the IT services there. So there wasn't really anything suspicious within that email, although it did look a little bit strange. However, um, you know, the correct action here would be for the user to, to figure out were they expecting an attachment, were they expecting an email like that to come through and to contact the IT service desk. Um, and sometimes criminals will try and build up a rapport with you, first of all, uh, before, you know, actually making you do anything. But certainly this one was a, a real example. Um, of a, a genuine email, it just didn't match the security standards in the email account. So check with IT before you open any attachments and essentially let that email out of quarantine. Right, I've got one more. Hi, Anna. Uh, I saw your recent presentation at the Green Energy UK conference. I have attached a new research paper that you might find interesting. It hasn't been published. Regards and the attachment. Bye. Any ideas, anyone? It's a fish. Who said that? Martin. And what, why do you think that is? There's, uh, just looking at the email address, there's something odd about that. And also that there's an email address, but no name. Mm -hmm. so they haven't like signed off like you yeah. would normally have yeah. idea. Yeah. Okay looks suspicious you're suspicious michael yes yeah why why are you suspicious of this of this one well that's not a proper email address at the bottom mm -hmm. yeah it's a, i think this is a tricky one because you know it, this looks like a genuine email kind of thing and it's coming into anna so Let's let's take a look and what are we what's the majority saying? Do we think it's real or do we think it's fake? Fake. 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 Oh. Real. Real. <laughs> <Let's see. laughs> Somebody just wanted to put something else in there, didn't they? <laughs> we will find out. And the answer is it is a fish. So you were right to be suspicious of this email. And what this is an example of is a message for, as a more targeted approach to phishing. So this is an example of a spear phishing attack where it's targeted to, uh, to compromise the user, in this case, Anna. Um, you know, it really appears convincing as it includes authentic, you know, authentic details of that she's recently presented at a conference. You know, Anna was there. And what the Fisher is trying to do is he's, they've found out this information online and they've targeted Anna to be like, I'm going to find, like, pinpoint Anna because maybe she does the finance stuff in the organization or maybe she's just a target to, to lead to someone else. Um, but what they're trying to do is entice her to open the attachment and invoke that curiosity. You know, the appeal of getting that early knowledge of new research in this, this specific area. And these ones, I think, particularly are very hard to identify especially if they're more sophisticated or tailored. So anything in this sort of case, and you're not expecting it, it's always wise just to maybe check it over with your IT team, even if you think, um, you, you, even if you have taken the bait and you have opened it, do let that IT team know. But that leads us on to, you know, how do the criminals kind of get that information? How would they source that on the internet and find it? Well, we've got um, Mark Cunningham Dickey on the, on the call, and he's going to talk us through a little bit of the motivations behind it. So, Mark, will I stop sharing my screen and, and pass over so that you can? Yeah, please, I'll, I'll share mine. So, um, before I do, uh, my name is Mark Cunningham Dickey. I'm the, I'm the Cyber Incident Response Manager at SBRC. So, if you, uh, we'll, we'll discuss it at the end, but if you are hit by a cyber incident, then uh, call me. However, my previous role, uh, as Martin alluded to right at the start, was I worked for uh, the Police Service of Scotland. And uh, to cut a very long story short with regards to the work that I did, uh, I was 
the senior hacker there. Uh, I had a small team of hackers that I directed. Within that, uh, as part of our role and remit, we did do uh, phishing campaigns uh, and um, we did pull information. There are, uh, <laughs> there's a whole raft of uh, different things that I can include. Uh, but to be honest, the presentation is, uh, I don't have enough time to actually go into that on this one. Now, Alison has been very, very gracious um, and has agreed. Now, everything that I'm going to show you uh, is being done in real time. Um, so I'll, I'll share my screen. Um, what all of these are... There's nothing here that is actually a paid for requirement. Now I do have some additional, can everybody see my screen? It says Multigo one at the top. Yes. Yeah, I'm seeing lots of nodding. Excellent. So everything that is actually being done is being done in real time. Uh, I haven't investigated Alison yet, uh, but we soon shall. And if everything goes horribly wrong, then I did actually load in the panel members at the top as well, <laughs> just in case anybody's <laughs> suspicious so um if if anything goes wrong with that with uh me uh trying to identify how i'm going to fish allison and get information uh then we can always target the other panel members so. <laughs> i'm so, feeling quite quite vulnerable here mark i hope you're going to be uh, kind to me well all of this information all of these things all it's doing is it's going out uh this is just a tool that allows me to collect information in a single place. Now I can go out and I can pull all of this information separately. Um, so I could go to the different websites. I have a variety of different tools. Now, some of the tools that I'm going to show you are really basic. So you get various different levels of hacker capability. And uh, the one that I'm, uh, the ones that I'll go on to are the lowest level. They are the nodding ones. They, these are the ones that will guide you through. So I've identified that Alison Stone works for SCVO and that they, this is their website. Now this is really basic information. Can we all agree that? Okay, so let's start off by taking a bit of a look at Alison Stone. Now these are the various different options. Some of these would be paid for. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and find addresses for the person. So what this will do is it will go out uh, and it will try to find uh, email addresses associated with Alison Stone for scvo.org.uk. And we'll run that. So what this will do is it will go away, it'll check lots of different places for me and hopefully if things actually, um, if things actually work, it should start to populate some information. Now there's lots of different things that I can do at the same time as well. So I can go to uh, this and we can start seeing if we can identify email addresses from their domain as well. So is there anybody else within the organization that I might want to be looking at? And hello, here we go, it starts to light up. So um, interestingly, it's shot into other places as well. So I'm, I may have had a separate domain lit up there uh, as well. So it may be running quite a few things. Now that's obviously going to be tiny, but Alison will be able to identify, you know, these are email addresses that are associated with SCVO. Am I correct? Yeah. I'm surprised that the one for Alison hasn't actually come back. I'll just run that one again. Because I almost always get something from an individual. Now, from these, what I would typically do uh, from a phishing email, uh, as Kirsty says, is trying to give a level of authenticity. It's trying to give a level of confidence. So I've, I've identified some email addresses within SCVO that I might want to target. Um, so what I would want to do is I want to find out if any of these have ever actually had details compromised. So have I been pawned is a website that you can go to check. Is everybody aware of have I been pawned? Yeah, there's, there's nods. Okay. So uh, have I been pawned is a website that you can go to, you can enter your email address into and it will tell you if your details have been leaked onto the internet. Um, it's, it's spelt with an E there. The actual website is 
have I been pwnd.com. Um, but I'll run this transform and hopefully we'll start to see, it'll all start to shoot in in a minute uh, as it goes away and it churns away in the background. And here we go, we've started to identify some already. And you'll see that my graph automatically updates and this is starting to identify where information has uh, leaked onto the internet or being captured as a result of, um, of data breaches in other locations. So if it's been logged as a data breach, we're gonna find it in here. So I'm just going to, uh, I'm just gonna scroll out a bit because obviously this is starting to get a little bit large um, already. So we've, we've found some things. Uh, so we've got one email address that hasn't been breached. It is still running away in the background. There's some things that aren't listed. Oh, it's still shifting around. So we're, we're starting to get uh, different information in. There's a potential chance that, I'm, oh, excellent, we've got Adobe. So I always like it when, uh, when we get actual manufacturers. So, and that's a, a recent one. Lead Hunter is from uh, the start of this year, actually. That was March of 2020. Uh, that they lost quite a bit of uh, they lost quite a bit of information. The good part about this is that I can actually uh, click on the information and it will uh, have I been pawned. There you go. There's a website. Oh, it does have an e in it. I beg your pardon. Um, I'm pretty sure there's one that doesn't have an e in it. Uh, but that was a breach in March 2020, and it tells you the sorts of details that were actually lost. So there wasn't a password that was lost there, but it it shows me that I can enumerate some further details. I can get additional details out of there. Adobe's always a good one to see for me because it shows that they've got an Adobe product. Now Adobe have quite a few vulnerabilities, certainly within the PDFs. So this is why you really want to, the PDF readers. So this is why you really want to maintain your patching levels. So that what I would typically be doing is I'm, I would be sitting looking at this going, okay, we've got Adobe. What I will do instead of doing a website, which was what I'm going to take you through, uh, I would probably look to create a malicious PDF that I would then send to the IT help desk because that's been associated with Adobe. So I, I know generally that they're in that area uh, and I'll be able to enumerate some further information, uh, maybe get a password uh, for somebody. And if I do get a password for somebody, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to find out who works with them. Maybe somebody in the same department. If they, if they work in finance, absolutely brilliant, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to send them an email posing as being the person whose password I've managed to capture. And I'm going to send that to a colleague. And I'm going to watch you on social media. Uh, and I'm going to see for when you're going away or when you're doing something. And I'm going to send that person an email and I'm going to say, listen, I'm away at the moment, uh, but I've had an invoice in and it really needs paid. Can you pay uh, such and such a person uh, this bank account, this amount of money? Can you do that million pound transfer for me? Here's my username. Here's my password. Uh, I'll change my password on Monday. I'm really sorry to have bothered you, but it needs to be paid. Uh, as soon as possible. So what I'm doing there is, as, as Kirsty's explained, I'm adding, the, uh, I'm adding the urgency, I'm saying what I need, people will know that I'm away because I'll have discussed it in the, because you'll have discussed it in the office and I've tracked it on social media. And then I'm adding the additional level of authenticity because I'm providing my username and my password. So if that person goes away and then tries that password, they go, it's legitimate, it is definitely Alison because She's given me her details and it's worked. So I'll just transfer that million pounds to this bank account because she knows what she's doing. And I'm before Monday, I'm away with a million quid. So already we've identified that. Now, obviously, because there's Adobe there, I would typically be looking at creating a malicious, uh, uh, a malicious PDF that I would attach to a document. And you can bypass antivirus. I have bypassed antivirus. Antiviruses are not as good as people tend to let on. So if you are ever unsure, if it's got through your email system, you can upload it to a, to a, a website called virustotal.com and that will, that will send it through loads of different uh, virus checkers as well. So it's not just your local virus checker, it's them trying to get it across loads of different ones. And there's some really good heuristic ones that will pull them apart, put them back together and give you, give you a better picture. So that's how I'm going to find information out. Now, there's, there are other ways. If, 
if I'm struggling to get information on an individual, then there's plenty of other things that I can actually run. Showdown's always a good one. I actually have a Showdown account attached to this. Uh, and Showdown will actually pull lots of different bits of information. You can see it leaping in here. It's finding different domain entries for SCVO. Um, it will start to enumerate what ports are open. So I'm, I'm starting to find your email addresses out here, uh, your email servers. What else am I finding? It's a bit difficult just running on one screen. There we go, email.scvo.org.uk. Uh, and what I'll actually do is, as I say, all of these things are, are real time and I haven't actually uh, I haven't actually run across Alan's account yet. Um, I'll run, I'll just run a level one footprint. Now this won't take too long, but it will start to enumerate the scvo.org.uk uh, uh, domain. So this will start to come in. Let me just back it out slightly. So this is changing all of the time. I'm just gonna see if it will uh, shift into a slightly neater format for me. Here we go. So, okay, now I've got your IP addresses as well. So I know where some of your equipment is now based. I've got IP addresses that I can start to target with my, uh, with vulnerability assessments. Here's some of your other devices, what's that connected to? Uh, so we've got, oh, so we've, we've got Cloudflare as well. So there's a level of protection against the website and possibly not going to attack the website. And now I've just seen DMARC. So I'm not going to try spoofing an address from Alison because uh, if I try that, then I'm going to get caught. Uh, it's, it's a good method of blocking. So this is how I build up the reconnaissance. This is how I'm thinking with regards to, uh, with regards to how I'm going to attack you. Now, I'm going to send you an email. Uh, so I need to clone a website. Now, I'm going to show you a really short video uh, on this. Um, again, it's, it's done real time. Can you, can you see uh, per, uh, uh, harvesting personal details on my desktop or are you still staring at Multiga? Uh, we're still staring at the other thing, I think. Okay, I'm just going to stop sharing and, I'll, uh, and I will send you on to uh, my PowerPoint slide. Mark, that was really, really spooky. <laughs> so, can you now see harvesting personal details? Yes. 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 So I'm just going to play this. This is real time. This isn't sped up. So this gives you an example as to uh, just how easy it actually is. Now I'll take you through uh, social engineering toolkit in a second as well. Um, so what we're trying to do here is what I'm going to do is I'm going to clone a website uh, and I'm going to target one that uh, has a bit of bite to it. Um, so I want something that is going to require you to log on because I'm going to try harvesting your details. So here I'm targeting Bank of Scotland. Maybe some of you use Bank of Scotland, maybe some of you are using RBS, it really doesn't matter. Um, and here's the actual Bank of Scotland login page and there's the fake one. That's the one that I've just generated. So we can actually just flick between these two screens and you'll see there's very little difference. What you're spotting at the top is secure, not secure. What I would say is uh, I am seeing an increase in the number of uh, spoof websites that do have legitimate certificates associated with them. So always check the certificate. I had one the other day that was for uh, a Scottish wind farm. It was a spoof website. It had the legitimate padlock. It was green. It all looked legitimate. When I actually looked at the certificate, it was registered to uh, a glazing company in uh, Yorkshire. Uh, and it was just that it had been added into the list of aliases. And we're, we're seeing criminals start to use these methods as a way, uh, using aliases within certificates as a way of trying to get past some of the, uh, some of the requirements by certificate providers of not spoofing banks and things like that. So if you try to register uh, Halifax Bank, so you're missing a character out of it, then typically they will say, no, we're not allowing you to register that DNS. No, we're not allowing you to, re uh, to register a, a certificate against it. So we're starting to see that some are starting to add uh, security to them. Now, all I need to do from this perspective is uh, just modify the backend slightly. So instead, of write, so instead of trying to send that information to the Bank of Scotland, 
it will actually write your details to my uh, to my database. So I'm starting to collect your username and password. Right. So I know that I'm running over time. There is one last thing that I will actually show you, and that is with regards to just how easy it is to uh, sending phishing attacks. So I now need to bring up my VM. So this is, show my screen. So this is uh, my Kali box. And Kali is a pen testing tool, essentially. Here, this, is, um, this is a social engineering toolkit. So you've got various different things. If I had more time, I'd take you through, but I'm very conscious that we're pressed for time. So I'm not going to take you through this. So this is actually a free tool for doing phishing campaigns. And this is used by cyber criminals. Uh, it's also used by internal organizations in order to test their uh, users. So just to give you an idea of the complexity, you would need to, I'm not going to fish anybody uh, live because that would just be unfair of me. Uh, so just to give you a context, we can create different campaigns. This helps cyber criminals so that way they can go, right, okay, so this would be um, a charities. Uh, and we would create an email template, so we can create ones that would be very specific to uh, to charities, and we can create a number of different templates, and we can we can customize who we're actually going to target. Um, the landing page, so this would be the page that we're trying to get people to go through to. So I would take this and the the site that I've already created that has the uh, login page with the back end that's feeding into my database. This is where I would actually point that. So we've got the uh, where it's going to. And the URL, I would embed an image just so that way I can track how many people have received the email, how many people have opened the email, and then track how many people have actually clicked through. So I can actually identify all of these different steps all the way through. Now, from a hacker's perspective, that's brilliant. For, from a teaching perspective, for a from a testing perspective internally, this is really valuable. The number of people that actually open the email, the number of people that have seen it, because it could be that somebody's away on annual leave. So if they've not seen it and they've not opened it within a certain time frame, then that's absolutely fine. You can actually understand that. So you can set when do you actually want it. So this is more, more than likely going to be Friday, 3.30 p.m., 4 p.m., things like that and send emails by. So you can actually stretch emails out so you're not sending it to 100 people all at once. And the reason that we do that is so that, that way we start to bypass uh, checks. So if I've compromised uh, a mail server and I'm using somebody else's mail server to send these emails, then if I suddenly send a thousand emails through it, sorry, Kirsty. I was going to say, can, it, can we jump to, uh, to our future slides only because we've only got a set amount of time left? Yeah, sure. Um, so I will stop sharing. I do apologize. I think, I I think what Mark was covering there was like really interesting and we've got, I think he's showing you there the sort of free tools and some of the tools available that people can kind of use to help uh, do some of these cyber attacks onto individuals and charities. Uh, if only we had more time to kind of go through these a bit more in detail, but I just was cautious there, but we want to jump on and make sure you've got some tips to, to leave with. Um, so that you, you know kind of what to do um, in these cases. So I'm just going to share my last couple of slides with you. Okay. Can you see that? Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Can you bring in the first point? Oh, that, that's wonderful. Thank you. I am, I'm going to rattle through these because I, I think that the value in these sessions is, is the questions and answers. Um, and if we're going to point you in the directions of some, some resources where you can get further information. My job is all about educating the third sector. So um, please, if there's anything that isn't clear or there's anything you want more information on after this event, please reach out to me because I'm happy to help. Um, we're just trying to squeeze too much in this, this one hour session, but it has been fabulous. So helpful hints to avoid phishing attacks. Um, make sure that every user account you configure it correctly. Um, make sure that you have organized, sorry, people within your organization that have their own accounts. Don't share accounts in, in email or, or, or for software because that's where trouble begins to start. Have a little bit of a think about how you operate. Um, this, this has been an area in which has been, been really taken advantage of during the pandemic. Um, when we've got 
slightly broken or changed processes with people working from home. Now, if I want an invoice signed off, I can't walk up the stairs and take it to accounts. I have to follow a different process. And cyber criminals have taken advantage of, of, of different ways of doing things. Um, so think about the actual physical protocols and processes that you have in place um, and make sure that you, you're doing those with security in mind. Kirsty's talked a lot about the obvious signs of phishing, um, that urgency, that bad spelling. Um, one thing I would absolutely say is the, these phishing attacks are incredibly sophisticated. Um, they are very, very convincing. They're very well crafted. And should you ever fall for a phishing attack, there is no reason to be ashamed, embarrassed, upset, because they are so legitimate looking. The, the escalation process, get it reported, um, make sure that you, know, you, you, you tell the IT people or, or wh whoever so that this can be, can be managed appropriately. Um, but yeah, this stuff is really, really clever. So please never feel embarrassed. Um, have a look at your digital footprint, see what information you're putting out there. Um, we voluntarily put a lot of stuff out on the internet. Um, I'm the world's worst for sending photos of what I've had for my tea onto Facebook. Um, just be very, very mindful of what it is that you're putting out there and be mindful of what your friends are putting out there. If they're tagging you when you're out on your favorite restaurant and that they're, you know, they're, they're attaching you to a post that they're doing, you don't have control of that. Um, and there's ways of setting up, uh, up, up your system so that you can, can be asked before anybody tags you. Just be mindful of what, what's out there. Um, and report all attacks. Um, as I say, there's nothing to be embarrassed about here. Um, we've, we all have the potential to fall for phishing emails, even people that, that do this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Kirsty, will I hand over to you to, to do the, the demonstration of the, the reporting? Yes, so we've got um, a reporting service that's been launched by the National Cyber Security Centre. So if you get fake emails to your personal account, to your work account, and you know that they are fake and you haven't like touched them or anything, you can forward these on to the National Cyber Security Center's reporting tool. So you would just forward on the email to report at phishing.gov.uk or if it's a text message, 7726. I'm going to show a demo of, of doing it here. But essentially this will help um, take down any existing um, emails that are known to be phishing and it will stop um, the, it continuing to be live essentially. So NCSE have had 4 million people report uh, scam emails already and managed to take down a lot of these addresses. So it's worth reporting these to NCSE if you can. And as Alison said, they can be very difficult to spot um, phishing attempts and anybody might click on a phishing email at some point, I'm sure we all will. Do not worry about this. Um, you know, if you can tell somebody immediately about it, it will help reduce the potential harm. And uh, fraudsters rely on people feeling too ashamed to admit that they've done these things. And not to worry because Mark does have a hotline that you can phone him up should you have a cyber incident. So please take a screenshot of this um, number on the screen. He is able to answer any calls. It says weekdays nine to five, but I know Mark is always. Uh, Going to be answering these calls so should you fall victim to any cyber attack mark will be able to answer it on on the phone there and help you triage your situation and get back to running normally and unlike the title of this um, hotline he can answer the phone and give advice and guidance on any of the sort of cyber security topics you don't have to be fall a, a victim before you give mark a call so that's an excellent free number there and i'm sure we'll, we'll share it as well after the event Okay, quick wrap up here. Um, there's a whole raft of information that is available. Um, there's a load of stuff on the internet, but we'd always recommend that you look at a trusted source. Um, the National Cyber Security Centre are the oracle for all things cyber in the UK. Um, and they have got some fantastic resources for the third sector. Um, the small charity guide is excellent. Um, there is also a response and recovery guide. Um, should you fall victim to, to, to an attack that tells you what to do afterwards. Um, it also gives you some really good ideas of, of some proactive stuff that you can do in advance. So definitely get onto the NCSE website and have a good rootle around there because there's some really brilliant stuff. Um, there's guides on fishing as well, so yeah. certainly one to look at. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned before, um, I'm here 
to help you if there's anything that you, that you need, if you need training for your organizations, more than happy to do something online. Um, we've talked a little bit about what happens if you fall victim and Mark and his team are there to help you to triage and, 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 and do some technical stuff to help you to recover. Um, if you do have an incident, um, and it, cyber incidents, I have to say, are sadly woefully underreported, please do report it to Police Scotland um, on 101. Uh, that helps bring build up a picture of the intelligence of the size of this issue that, we're, that we have here in the UK. So it's really, really important that, that incidents are reported. Um, it's, it's Police Scotland in Scotland. Um, if, it's, if it's for um, an organisation in, in the other three countries, it's action fraud. Um, in line with your GDPR stuff, if there's a data breach, um, inform the ICO within 72 hours of discovering that data breach. Um, and Martin alluded to the notifiable event procedure with Oscar um, that may come into play here as well. Um, the other thing to consider if you need to escalate or inform any other regulators or funders, um, they, they may need to be made aware if you've had a, a cyber attack, a data breach or, or something that, that may be troublesome. Um, that may escalate. So, so, but I think that the, the basic message here is there's definitely help at hand. There's a whole bunch of information out there that will help you become more secure. Um, and should God forbid that the worst happen to you, there's a whole lot of people that are there to help you too. So hopefully that's been a useful session. Um, there we go. Um, should we open up for very quick questions? If I, we're not rushing off, so if anybody wants to, to stay around and ask, Questions, have questions answered, happy to stay on. Sure. I think we've got a question from um, Michael there. He's got his hand up. Should we also report these attacks to the local authority who have um, a department that deals with um, breaches of trading, trading standards breaches? I guess depending on what what the attack is and, and how it manifests itself i think that's probably a very good idea michael yes yeah, yeah. 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 speaking to police scotland first they would be able to, to signpost you on who else you should be sharing the information with um I, I had two emails purporting to come from the bank of scotland commercial hmm. section they were very very convincing so yeah. i printed them out and took them to the bank and they said oh no that's not quite right yeah yeah, that's it. Yeah, I, I, I think we, we, we work with, with quite closely and give advice for a campaign called Take Five. And their, their basic message is take, take time to think about what's being presented to you. Is, is, this, actually, is this actually legitimate? Is this actually right? Um, is this ringing alarm bells? Um, nobody would mind you taking that little bit of time if it's going to be the, the thing that stops you getting scammed or, or having a fraudulent action against you. Just you know look at the information that you have and, and think is this does this look legit and do share it with the police do take advice from trading standards from mark from sbrc um because we'd rather you checked than than came back afterwards and and we had to try and recover the whole situation for you yeah and i think if the if the worst does happen and uh you are scammed and, and there are your know, repercussions for the charity i, I would encourage you to you know, report it to us under that uh, notifiable events uh, regime that we have um, that's you know and, and to, to, to tell us what you know what it is you, you, you've done about it in terms of, of reporting and, and taking action that's partly so that you know we have that that, that sense of what's going on, on in your charity but also it gives us a sense of what's going on in the sector and and just what the vulnerabilities are and that helps us uh, regulate and, and work with the other agencies I'm just looking at the chat and, and everybody keeps going, I'm really, really scared. <laughs> I know, I know. Mark and I have a laugh about this because we always say that Mark likes to terrify people and I usually try and give the, <laughs> the other approach. So that's so why we've got a good balance in it. Kirsten has this angelic nature and I've just got the demon wings. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think some of the key things that, you know, like Mark's tools that he was using that he uh, uses to um, find and do these like, attack methods is, you know, doing simple things like adjusting when you tell people that you're going on holiday, not posting that online um, can make a big change into if you're going to be targeted or not. And those are some, you know, simple things that, that you can do is that slight shift when how much information are you revealing to people that could be used against you. And that's not to say don't 
put anything on your social media, but there's a good option that I like to call the Beyonce method, where she tells all her fans what she's doing online, but she just waits a couple of weeks later and then posts it to see what a brilliant holiday she had last week. And that slight shift and change in when you post information online can be a big difference to whether you're going to be a victim. Are there any more questions? Or oh, Paula, I know we had a couple of questions that came in pre-event. Um, have we got? Will we try and tackle uh, those? Alan, Alan, Harper had Alan Harper had his hand up. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Alan. Apologies. Okay. What? What? Uh, the, thank you for a fascinating. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say conversation, <laughs> but uh, absolutely <laughs> fascinating presentation. That's superb. Um, my question relates to what remedies, what comeback can we have? if we have been fished, fished and, and find that we have lost something. So where do we go? How do we, how do we cope with, with that? And who do we, re okay, we've got who can, we can report it to, but it's, it's the actual, what do we do next? Yeah. Mark, do you want to come in on this? Yeah, so it, it depends very much on how things are investigated uh, and by whom and to whom it's also reported as well. Um, I had a rather um, concerning call uh, right at the very start of this week. It was actually passed through to me uh, by Jim McCory, who's the CEO of uh, SBRC. And it was a gentleman. It was, actually wasn't a cyber attack. It was a phishing attack, but it was done by phone. Uh, and it was incredibly heartbreaking. He'd lost about 80 to 88,000 uh, pounds from uh, his company and his wife's account. Uh, and they'd called up, they were incredibly convincing. Now, uh, he had reported it to Police Scotland. Um, it had actually happened uh, a week the previous Friday, so it was actually back in November uh, that it had happened, but he'd only, he'd not had any further contact from Police Scotland. Now Jude has been absolutely brilliant. She's leveraged her uh, contacts in Police Scotland. She's leveraged her contacts at the bank uh, to really push them forwards. And uh, when I spoke to him, I'll, I'll be honest, I was very concerned about his mental health and his well-being. And he did, he was very open and honest with me, which I thanked him for, uh, because obviously it was a very difficult time for him. But he was saying, you know, this has affected me. I can't look my wife in the eye. Uh, I'm really worried about my business. And, you know, I, my heart goes out to him for these things. Uh, but the, the person that had called him had seemed really legitimate. It talked him into essentially a frenzy uh, and talked him into transferring money from uh, one bank account to another. And it, it provided really good information as well um, on the... Uh, on the individual's bank details as well. So it'd been incredibly convincing. Now, uh, Jude's been brilliant. She's leveraged her uh, contacts, as I say. Um, as a result of that, CID, ha had, he had been visited by Police Scotland, but he'd not had any follow-up uh, information. CID have actually been out to him. He sent us an email to thank us uh, because it spent about four hours with him going through various different things, collecting information, etc. And I know that the banks are actually following up with this as well, um, just purely because he had tried to contact the banks while it was actually happening, but he hadn't been able to get through to the bank lines. So they are following up. I don't know what the outcome of this story is going to be. Uh, it's unlikely unless I... Uh, individual gets in contact with me again to actually let me know that I will know what that outcome is because Police Scotland obviously can't divulge that information to me and nor can the banks. So it, it does go to show, you know, if you do engage with us, we, we have levers that we can pull. Uh, it may be that if the money has left Scotland, if it's still in uh, the UK, then it may go down to the Met, uh, at which point Jude actually has contacts down there. I've got contacts down there. Uh, and she's still got these levers that we can pull. It's, it's very difficult and it, it depends from my perspective if I can get attribution as to what servers they actually used in order to send an email. So uh, the, the actual technical aspect, the cyber side of things. If I can get that, then I can start tracing things back. I can start pulling logs back. I can engage with Police Scotland. I can, get, um, I, I can try to get warrants to get information from companies who potentially have been compromised and whose email uh, servers have been used. So it depends, every, 
every cyber incident is different. Every fraud incident is different. Um, it doesn't matter how many templates we come up with. It just depends on what we can actually piece together. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Sorry, Kirsty. No, Barbara, no. Yes. I was going. I was going to say. Um, having like the steps in place to as much prevent as much damage as you possibly can is, is the best thing that we can do. Um, so having the, there's a thing called the cyber essentials, which is basically five key things that you should implement in your organization to see if you, to help improve um, you being victims of cyber attacks. And if you've got these steps into place, it can prevent up to 80% of the most common cyber um, methods. So that's something that is a, a, a UK government initiative that we're trying to get everybody at a cyber essentials level within their organisation um, and having those sort of steps there. there some can be low cost, some depending on how much you need to change within your organisation, but you know, at least having these sort of sessions and being mindful of what you can change will, will help in, in the, the term. And I, I believe that the cyber essentials does come with cyber insurance, which is a whole other sort of topic to go into, but um, certainly something to look into. If anybody wants information on cyber essentials, just contact me because I manage the grant scheme that is is no longer sadly available to the third sector, uh, but I know a lot of information about the technical controls. I think, Paula, we, Martin, we probably need to wind this up, but I'm aware we, we've got a lot of questions in the chat, a few pre-questions. Can we come back to people independently um, and, and personally uh, to answer these questions? I, I, I know we're all busy people and we probably need to move on. Um, does that suit? Yeah. yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, okay. So I think uh, that I've, I found that really, uh, really informative. I am thinking very hard about an email that I had yesterday, but fortunately didn't click on. Um, so uh, I I'm really appreciate uh, the, the, the time that Kirsty and, and, and Mark and, and Alison have, have put in. Uh, I hope we've all got a lot out of that uh, and it was really worth looking at some of the links that are there in the, in, in the chat uh, and, and I'll certainly go and have a look at those myself. Uh, thanks very much and, and thanks to you, to you all for participating. And, and no worries, any, any queries just contact any one of us and we'll help you further. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thanks very much.